Hi, everyone. My name is John Osborne. I'm a supply chain architect at ChainGuard. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about SigStore, which is a free signing service under the Linux Foundation. Uh, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about it in the context of Salsa, which is a supply chain framework that's been out for a little while. Uh, and the reason why I'm going to put that little bit of a spin on it, if you've heard SigStore talks before, uh, this isn't just about the tech, but how it fits into the framework, uh, is because all these emerging, there's kind of three emerging frameworks right now. One is Salsa. Uh, another one is the CIS benchmarks for supply chain that came out, another one from NIST called NIST SSDF. And in all these different supply chain frameworks, you end up signing a lot of things. And so it ends up needing to be automated. You're constantly not only just signing your, your artifacts, but you're main, making these things called attestations, which could be include things like an SBOM or um, other just statements that you want to make about your build systems, about your dependencies, about your source code, and so on. And so Six store ends up playing a big role because it's kind of constantly signing things, um, artifacts and um, and documentation, attestations about the process uh, as it goes along. And so there's a big role there for Six store. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time putting together content on the supply chain framework in general, but I did want to start off this talk with talking a little bit about how ChainGuard uh, views this this uh, this problem space specifically. So I'll share my screen right here. There we go. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit about the role of Six Store inside of the supply chain journey. And let's see. Now, first, I, I wanted to talk about what is software supply chain, and that's really important because I think one thing specifically that gets lost when we talk about supply chain is people immediately tend to look at dependencies, and that is a big role inside of software supply chain, all your dependencies that you bring in, and then their dependencies and all the layers below that, your dependency trees or graphs, whatever it may, may look like. There's been lots of studies out there on different languages and how many levels they go typically um, in some languages are better than others. Um, but software supply chain isn't just about your dependencies and it kind of breaks down. I like to think of it as two parts. One is your dependencies and then the other pieces is all the systems that would interact with an artifact from development out to production. So it could be, include things like your IDE, for instance, in the case of the SolarWinds, um, or it could include things like uh, locking down your Git repos and not just other uh, testing and attestations. And those things tend to run you know, as privileged users and, and those types of things. So limiting access to those, um, uh, removing different ways that your system could be compromised as it goes all the way from development out to production. And so we at ChainGuard really view the software supply chain problem as a lack of transparency. And the reason why is because if you look at historically how we've done security, it's really based around doing, uh, you know, putting better fences around our systems, implementing better security practices for what is running in production. But it hasn't necessarily been around all those th type of things that now we're trying to address in the supply chain framework. And the reason for that is we really just didn't have the information. So Historically, there's been no way to tell whether you know who wrote an Apache Commons library, or even if you know something came from a certain person. There's really no proof. There's definitely no cryptographic evidence um, that something came from a person that it says it is, or what methods and that they used to build their systems. I mean, for me personally, I use Fedora on my desktop, and if anything that's almost user-facing. Uh, you know, video, audio, those types of things. Those projects typically are maintained by one person that I've never met or heard of, right? So it's it's uh, there's a lot that goes into um, supply chain. Now this query here is is uh, one that I run in BigQuery. If you go to depths.dev, which is a um, project essentially from Google, where they where they just in ingested all this data about dependencies out there. They went to GitHub. They went to all the main repos that are out there and they just ingested all this data and they really try to track what projects are dependent on each other and then what is the state of those projects are they maintained when is the last commit are there dependencies out there and there's a really good blog out there on devs.dev but they also made the data set publicly available on bigquery which is pretty cool so i went and i ran this query and what it does is uh, these were projects at the time that i ran it that uh, had critical cdes but then also had major, uh, they were major dependents for uh, for other projects. So this could have been JUnit, you know, a lot of these you've heard of, um, a lot of 
Node.js projects out there, these could be really low in the stack, which means, for instance, uh, the J unit, right? There's 63 projects uh, that are depending on that, but there's probably 60, there's probably each one of those 63 projects probably has other projects above it, right? Usually J, J unit's pretty low in the stack. So the sprawl there that's now inheriting this CVE, at least the time that I ran this, is very, very large, right? So that that's a problem we don't really necessarily know the CVEs of all our dependencies, or at least, our, and definitely not our transitive dependencies. The second aspect to it is all the systems that's, that's going to interact with your artifact as it goes out there. And one of the things I look at is, you know, historically, if you look at, let's say historically, but in the last few years, DevSecOps, right? A lot of, um, let's take the people and process uh, part of it out there because that's a whole separate conversation. But the DevSecOps, a lot of it in terms of technology has been about shifting left, right? So taking uh, all the out of band stuff that we used to do at the end of the software lifecycle and shifting it left, right? So that's important. Of course, we should do that. That gets us feedback and gets our systems out the door faster. But what about all those systems that were already left, right? So those could be your Git management repos or your security scans, uh, all those things, right? Those have to be locked down as well. And I think part of it was we, took those for granted, right? And so a couple of questions I put here is there's really no way for most systems, most pipelines to just uh, do simple verifications. Like can the source code actually be verified in the sense that can you actually tie back what's running into production to Git commits, right? Do you have actually cryptographic evidence that can do that? Um, can the build system, can you, can you trace it back to the build system once it's running in production? Do you actually know where it came from? Is there any proof that it came from whatever deployed it, whether it be Tecton or Jenkins or GitHub Actions, whatever whatever it may be, right? So the little magnifying glass that I drew there, that's the Salsa logo. So when you really look at it from the, the Salsa perspective, there are things that are lacking there. And that's really what Salsa is intended to kind of fill in some of those gaps. Um, and there was a big announcement this week from uh, GitHub around Node.js Node and in SigStore. And, and one of the quotes was from GitHub, which I liked was, you know, there's really no guarantee that a package that's built actually came from that source code, right? So there's no way that to actually tie source code back to the compiled binaries uh, in most cases, right? So that, that's a problem. And there was an ex executive order uh, last year. And I thought that was it was interesting because it was the first executive order I've ever seen that actually called out specific technologies. They actually called out uh, things like SBOMs, which, is, which I'll talk about if you don't know what that is, that's fine, I'll, I'll address that. Uh, and shortly, um, but I grabbed this quote because I, I liked it and so I highlighted it and and what it said was basically the trust we place in our infrastructure is basically proportional to how transparent it is, right? And when we look at software supply chain, historically it hasn't been very transparent, right? So we want to increase transparency. So for us, we're looking at the software supply chain and we want to create transparency. So the way we're going to do that is essentially building a massive data layer around software supply chain artifacts or software supply chain metadata. And to me, the three main components to that, there are others, but the three main components of that are, is one digital signing. So in the, in this context, I'll talk about six store, but it could potentially be other projects as well. So those are di digital signatures, you're signing artifacts, you're signing um, all sorts of other uh, metadata as your project goes from development to production. Uh, the second piece is our SBOMs. So SBOMs is now mandated uh, in a lot of cases. So it's mandated, for instance, uh, if anyone wants to sell software to the government, they actually legally have to provide an SBOM now. And what is inside an SBOM is essentially a list of, um, essentially a, a list of software dependencies. Uh, it could be external systems, anything that it depends on. Also licensing, there's more to it than that, but the main components are your dependencies and your licensing. Those are important. And then the third piece, which I think a lot of people are probably new to, is called attestations. And attestations, it's not uh, that complicated. They're essentially JSON documents. And they're JSON documents that say specific things. So they might say something like, I did a two-peer review, or I did a static code analysis, or I did uh, follow this method of Salsa, or you know, I did a security scan. And we're actually created, I'll actually create an attestation for you during this webinar and we can sign it. And so then we'll have cryptographic evidence of uh, that I created it. It'll go into the six store log and you'll be able to take a look at that as well. So six store. So there have been uh, signing methods before six store. Really what it's trying to address is a couple key pieces. Is one, I think 
having a great UX, right? Anyone that's worked in software knows for a long time, if, if something's really hard, it's really going to be have low adoption, right? I, I came from Red Hat and, you know, it was pretty common. It was almost a, a joke that people would disable SE Linux, right? SE Linux is an incredibly powerful technology. Uh, it had stopped at least all the main uh, container breakouts if it was configured correctly that, that I've been tracking, right? So, um, but, you know, it's not necessarily easy to use unless it's automated for you, right? And so we know at Sixdoor, and there's a long, long record of other projects that have suffered from kind of similar similar fates, right? So we know that one, it has to be easy to use. And so the idea of Sixdoor is you don't have to necessarily know or manage keys. It's all done for you. Um, but then also it has something called keyless mode. So keyless mode is, you know, you get a short-term certificate and it's in it lives in memory. So in most cases, it doesn't touch disk. So no one has to manage it. No one has to worry about their public key or their private key. Um, and also, since it has this mode, it can plug into uh, automation systems. So if you're a person, it can just tie into your OIDC login, whether it be Google or GitHub, uh, or any number of OIDC logins. Or if you're an actual machine, it can tie into your workload like identity. There are integrations with Spiffy, uh, or anything else, really. It can tie into key management systems, for instance, uh, AWS. It can tie into their K uh, KMS system, same Google. Azure, anything I think with a PKCS11 uh, interface, it can it can tie into. So there's a couple key pieces uh, to SigStore. One is cosine. That's the piece that's actually making the signatures, and that's the that's what's actually signing things. Uh, Falsio is a certificate authority. All Falsio really does is essentially exchanges your OIDC login for a certificate. So you log in with Google, as an example, and you go to sign something, and then it's going to create you a short-term certificate that lives in memory, that it'll just be a standard X509 certificate, except the, the email that's in there will be your Gmail login that you logged in with, and it'll be just for key signing, and it lasts about, I think the default is 20 minutes, um, so it's very short-term. Um, and then the third piece is Recore. Recore is uh, essentially the, the transparency log on the back end that you can use for audits. You can use to verify that things were signed by individuals. Of course, you need some method to do that since the certificate's gonna be gone after 20 minutes, right? And so the whole point of this is that you can cryptographically create all these, these pieces. You can verify them in a, in a very easy way. Um, it's all community operated. So there was a very cool, um, ceremony last year it's on it's on youtube you can find it uh, they did a uh, essentially a tough ceremony so there's five uh five people walking around with ub keys that created this the root ca for for six store and they're all working for you know other corporations or or, or universities um, and there's also a free public instance out there so in the free public instance uh we've hit almost uh over three million entries so far in the community in the public record log So really, why we care about all this is simply around key automation. So this was um, just something I did on my laptop. You can sign anything, not just container images, not just um, attestations and SBOMs. You can actually sign at anything. So we've talked to customers that want to sign assembly code. We've talked to customers that want to assign, uh, sign, you know, all these binaries or, or legacy systems. And that makes sense, right? Because if you think about a legacy system, uh, say it's at you know, just say it's a uh, an edge type system, right? You built it, you're deploying it. In a lot of cases, especially in the enterprise, those things aren't necessarily getting updated very often, right? So if it's been running for a couple of years, you actually have no method of tying back that it's actually the same binary that you shipped two years ago, right? And so signatures help with that because you'll know that it actually is the same binary and you have evidence uh, that it is. But now that can be automated. So in this case, I just tied into my six store. So this is what I would see. When I go to sign something, I can log in with any OIDC piece. Uh, those three options are just the options on the free public instance. And then you just go to authorize it, and it's very similar to just logging into a third-party app. And I'll actually sign stuff here in a minute. The usage is very easy. Simply cosign sign, cosign uh, attest if you're signing an attestation, uh, and then verify, cosign verify. So all very straightforward there. Uh, if you're signing an SBOM, one nuance there is SBOMs are actually considered an attestation now. So if you go to sign something an SBOM, you'll actually just be signing 
uh, an attestation uh, that the SBOM is what you say it is. We also have a project called uh, Git Sign, which was really what the um, which is really what the GitHub announcement was this week, and I'll do a demo and talk a little bit about that uh, more also. Okay, so quick demo. I've got two demos for you here. And let's see. Hopefully, you can see my terminal zoomed in pretty well here. Okay, so actually, before I start, I wanted to real quick before I start. So this is the Google uh, container registry. And I just want to show you this because it's important. Um, and it has to do with signing because it's the way that they these things actually, these artifacts get stored. So this is a uh, pretty basic busy box image that I copied over about a half hour ago into this registry. So this is just the plain busy box latest. I copied it over. And I just want to point out the hash here ends in 693 because that's important and you'll see why in a second. So if I come back here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, um, to scan this. So I will I take this image. It's the busy box image. I'm actually going to scan it and we'll create some signatures based around the results. So I'm going to use Trivi which was a pretty cool free scanning tool. Let's see there. Should be pretty quick. This is done. We can look at the scanning results. Okay. So it scanned, uh, clean scan, because this was the BusyBox la latest. So that's very nice. Uh, we want to have clean scans, of course. Um, so what I can do now is I can actually create an attestation around that. And I'll just set some. Uh, environment variables, which aren't necessary per se, but it'll just help populate the attestation component to it. And I'll make a very short um, attestation. Sometimes these can get long, um, but in this case, I'll actually embed the scanning results inside of, uh, if you see here, the trivia scan, I'll actually embed the um, attestation or this, the scanning results inside my attestation. And I'm going to do that because that way I'll be able to prove later that this had a clean scan when it went out the door. Right, and so what I'll do, I'll sign the image first, so you can see that. Go sign, sign. Let's log in with my uh, Google. So I'll go back to the signature here, and it's going to say it's just telling me right now that this is in a private container registry. So it just wants to make sure that I want it want to go ahead because it is private. I'm going to say yes. And it pushed the signature to BusyBox uh, or to the Google Container Registry. So, and that's why I wanted to show you what this looks like. So, if I come back here, remember it descended in 693. So, if I come back to BusyBox, I can actually see I've got an attestation that I just pushed here, or I've got a signature that I just pushed here. So, I'll click on this. And this had this is the same hash ends in six nine three, but dot sig, and so that's just kind of one interesting nuance of cosine in general is when you sign something, it can actually store these things inside the container registry. It stores them in what's called an OCI artifact, and it can do that for signatures. So anything you create a signature, it'll just be dot sig. If you create an attestation, it'll just be dot att, and if you can create you can create sbombs too, and it'll be dot uh, sbomb. And if I look in here, I can actually uh, go see the manifest. So I can actually see some of these annotations inside the manifest here. So I can see that there is a certificate. I can see the chain. That's the that's the SIG store public chain there um, inside that manifest file. And so that's all very cool. Uh, now I can go back and create that attestation. So let me do that. And. We'll just look at the attestation real quick just so you can see it. So you can see the attestation that I've created. It's got 
some information in it. I populated that it's using Trivi and that version. And then it actually populated the, the Trivi results, embedded them inside the scan. Now this was a clean scan, so this was very, uh, very uh, short and sweet. Um, but now we can go ahead and sign that. So uh, remember, to, remember I said it's all very easy. So it's cosign a test is all we write here. So then I'm going to give it a type of vuln for vulnerability, which is part of the um, Intoto framework, which is a, a structured way to do these attestations. And then I'll just make that attestation based around these results. And that'll go inside that registry. So I'll click here, make it similar, or close the same. And I'll come back. They're probably going to ask me again if I want to go in the private repo. Yes, I do. And it should be pushed there. So it's now it's inside the transparency log also. So if I come in here, back to BusyBox. I can see there should be a new annotation in here. Again, it's 693.att. So this was the same. Uh, this was the same one. And if I look at this manifest file, um, we can see it's got the cosine signature and the cosine uh, certificate bundle, all those things. Again, this is an OCI artifact uh, that it put it put it inside, and that way it can store it in the registry. No cosine can sign any anything else, also. But um, if it signs something else other than a container registry, then you'll need our container image. Then you just need to keep track of the signatures. You could put them in an S3 bucket. You could put them. You could use the same naming convention with hash.sig or the hash.att. That's all something that you have the option to do. Um, we can also verify these things from the command line. So I'll bring up the command line here, and if I type uh, cosine verify, we can take a look, and it'll tell us if we've. Back to JQ. And this is important. So it'll verify that it's signed, but also by who it's been signed by. So in this case, I signed it. Uh, I used my, my work email and the other stuff is just a uh, certificate type of information, nothing important. Um, but that was cool. And then I can verify the attestation also. So I can make sure the attestation was uh, signed like we said it was. And yes, so this was the this was kind of the information that similar to what you saw, but it, it's using in Toto. So this is the, uh, the basically the structured way that we're creating these attestations, and it's got the signature. And at the end, um, it's got uh, the signature field down here. So there's also uh, the record log. So I can use the record log. And let me scroll up. Do we have the ID that was created? Let's scroll up here. I need to scroll all the way up to. Sorry, I forgot to grab this ID. So this was the entry in the log. So this was the three millionth one hundred and sixty-six thousand seven hundred and eighty-fifth entry in the log. So we can check that from the command line if we wanted to. And also there's a, a web interface also. So I'll show you what that looks like. This was the entry in the log. Uh, Three millionth, same attestation information, and it's all encoded. So you're not going to see any of the uh, the specifics for that. It's all encoded. Um, but if we go um, out to the web, also we can put that same ID inside of. There's a public interface here. So if I type that, and I can take a look. So it's proves that it was signed by Sigstor. It's my email, again, this is the X509 certificate that I created. So it, all it did was, since I logged in with Google, it took my Google email address and put it inside of ChainGuard. Of course, I can see that there. If I log down, this is all information encoded. Um, but that's the attestation. And if I want to do some verification, you can actually verify that things were. It's The back end is a Merkle tree. Uh, so if you're into um, crypto, um, cryptography, you can uh, go back and you can validate uh, this using the, the inclusion proof. You can actually validate things offline as well using this called signed entry stamp, which is something uh, that's very similar to what you would get in a certificate transparency uh, uh, framework or RFC. Essentially, it's, it's that same format and structure. Okay, so that's a demo of cosign. You understand how it works now. So really, it's it's important to level set on what that means. So Signatures by themselves actually don't um, do too much. They essentially, what do they guarantee? So they guarantee that one, 
uh, it's exactly the same as when you signed it and the guarantee that you signed it or the workload signed it, right? So the signatures by itself, they can, if you just sign a software artifact, you can prove that it was exactly that way and that you signed it the day you signed it, right? So that's good for making sure that things don't necessarily have changed, but we wanna do a lot more than that, right? So we wanna actually start signing all these other artifacts. We wanna start creating attestations around how it was built. The You'll start hearing this term called provenance. That's really based around the build process. So all the build systems that were interacted with it as it went out the door. Uh, most notably, typically what people are signing, the kind of three main things now is they're signing their Git commits, they're signing um, SBOMs, they're signing attestations in their artifacts. So SBOM, uh, there's two emerging standards out there right right now. I shouldn't say emerging, but they're, they're a lot of, they've actually been around for 10 years, but they're emerging in terms of popularity, I guess you could say. So one is SPDX, the other one is Cyclone. At ChainGuard, we're not too opinionated on it. I, I think both uh, formats will probably be here. Uh, one interesting nuance here, wrinkle, is there's actually an effort to put some companion documents out there with that. So one is called uh, VEX, or the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. What VEX is, is VEX is something that would come from a vendor. So it's a standardized way to make attestations essentially around uh, vulnerabilities. So a lot of companies have been doing this already. So for instance, I came from Red Hat. They had uh, they used an open uh, thing called Oval, uh, and that was a standard to say whether something was vulnerable or not. VEX is very similar. It's just a companion piece to uh, the SBOM, and it's an open way, right? So if you look at a lot of SCA tooling and things, they've been creating these big da databases that they've had for forever, right? SBOMS is an open way to do that because you know we're all using the same software, right? In the back end, it doesn't matter if you're in telco or a startup or um, if you're a bank, you're everyone's kind of using the same components, right? So let's have our standardized way to do that. And VEX is a standardized way for the vendors to make attestations about, you know, there's say that for instance, say there's a CVE, they can say if actually what they're shipping is affected by that. And it might not, right, for a number of reasons. It might just be mitigated in the context of, of the environment or a number of other factors, right? Um, attestations, this is new for a lot of people, so I think sometimes it can be a little confusing, but all it really is is a JSON document. And the reason why it's important is you can say things in a structured or unstructured way uh, about how about your software, right? So you could say things like, the build system that it created, and I'm going to create. I'm going to show you some specific at real live attestations in a second, um, in, in addition to the trivia one. Um, but you can also create unstructured ones if you want to, or create your own structure. So you might have, uh, for instance, your your organization might do things um, on top of certain frameworks or have their own checks. They might have their own review boards. You can make attestations that those things were followed, and they can be signed. Uh, commonly. I would say that the number one thing that we see uh, for attestations right now is how it was built. And you'll hear that term provenance a lot. Provenance just means how it was built. So for instance, uh, you'll find these slides, I'll put them in my, on my GitHub repo. Um, but you know, you might see something like there might be an attestation that says, okay, this was actually built from a very specific Git commit, right? Because that has to do with the provenance and how it was created. Um, you might have other ones around how it was tested. Um, and then you have a lot around security scans, which is uh, what I just showed you. Um, another interesting thing there is they're actually standardizing the security scan format now also. So if you noticed when I scanned with Trivi, it actually output it to something called Serif, which is, I think it's an Oasis standard uh, for how that looks like too. And this is all really important because everything is no longer going to be a one-off, right? So now we have standardized way to say what's what we're shipping with SBOMs, if they're affected by vulnerabilities with VEX, we have standardized way to sign things, we have standardized way to make common attestations and we have standardized way to do these security scans and other things. So now that everything's is standardized, we're going to be using all the same software, and we don't have to all do one-off efforts to validate and vet that software. And SigStore is really critical to all this because it's constantly just signing and verifying all these things, right? So all the attestations, think of anything that, as you get more advanced, a lot of customers now, they might just be signing, a, they might just be signing their documents, right? A, a, a way to start, or they might just be signing uh, their S bombs, right? Or just signing their container images, right? But as they get further along in the salsa path, they're constantly signing things. They're constantly uh, verifying them as they go out the door. So I wanted to 
that was all great, but I wanted to walk through some specifics on what that would look like. So just a few slides specific to Salsa. So uh, Salsa covers a lot of areas around your source code and your builds and your dependencies and all those things. But for this case, I'm just going to talk, I'm going to walk you through level one through four so you can see what it might look like, right? So Salsa level one is a lot of basics around documentation. Um, a Salsa level one build would say that you have a script to do it, right? We're not doing artesian handcrafted builds. Uh, you at least have a script. It could run in your laptop. Um, hopefully there's some providence available, some information around uh, how that was built, right? And there's a script to do that. Uh, this is a real life example um, that's in the record log on, on how to do that. And you can click back on that as well, but this was specific around Maven. So this person uh, was creating uh, using a Docker file and had some Maven and they've uh, some Maven packages and this one came from Red Hat and Red Hat's been an, an early adopter and contributor to SigStore as well and they've done a great job here. So in this case, they have uh, created attestations using the Intoto framework in the uh, use in the Salsa provenance uh, format around that. So as you get a little more mature past just scripting your builds, you might want to say that you actually have a build service, right? So in this case. Um, and they're using, this was Equinix, and they're using uh, making attestations um, around uh, their specific build. I think they're using GitHub um, actions, and they're making attestations around that, so that's important. So not only you're adding on, right? So you're not saying not only was it scripted, um, but I actually had a build service to do that, right? So it wasn't just a, a one-off running on someone's laptop. I'm actually managing that from a central place. I can start doing lockdowns around that. And now I'm, uh, I have to do provenance uh, on that too, right? So I have to sign it uh, to say that it was uh, created with that build service and I can verify that using cosign to verify the attestation. You can see how you get more mature as you go up to levels. And one of the reasons why I like Salsa specifically is it gives people an incremental path instead of um, you know, just a, an entire list. It's like, hey, here's, a, here's the, the crawl walk run path to get uh, you know, to secure your software supply chain. Level three, so you're building on that again. Not only do you have a central build service, but now you're building as code, right? So it's uh, more locked down. Uh, it's becoming a little bit more closer to hermetically sealed and you have non-falsifiable provenance. So you know exactly you have cryptographic evidence is now mandated at level three for your build system and for your build as code, right? So you're not, there's no way really to interact uh, with the system and uh, and there's limited paths to, to interrupt that process, right? So you don't have secret keys also in that system. You're using an external KMS to automate it, automatically pull that. So this doesn't, this very fits very well into GitOps, but GitOps isn't mandated here. It just mandates that you have a, a build system and that you can, uh, you have cryptographic evidence that it came from that build system. This was another, real life example uh, using the Salsa framework. They were using KO and GitHub Actions uh, around that and they've created uh, created uh, attestations that they did come from that and they had build as code. If you scroll, if you click on the example, you can scroll down and actually see all the materials that were used also for level three. Level four, so this is the, the highest level. Um, this is really where you start to um, get more in depth around some of the harder parts of software supply chain. So you're doing things like reproducible builds, which is a very big challenge. Not all build tools are reproducible. So if I go to build something with Docker, for instance, and I can build it multiple times, it's actually have different binaries. So it's it's hard to reproduce that. And this was really critical. You know, SolarWinds gets brought up in terms of the hack and stuff that, that, that happened, but they actually, they've been addressing it really aggressively. So if you looked at their talk, I think at KubeCon last year, it was really cool. And one of the things that they did was they actually created reproducible builds so they actually have two pipelines now that should produce the same binary. And so even if you know breaking into an IDE is really complex, as we saw with that attack, um, but now if someone broke into their IDE for whatever reason again, they would actually be able to, you know, even if they started signing stu stuff that had been compromised at level four, you would have reproducible builds and parallel pipelines. So you know, for instance, even if somebody did get in um, and was able to circumvent almost everything, well, you know that the binary didn't match. So you can go investigate that. And that's really, um, you know, Salsa level four is really designed to be kind of foolproof there. So um, you also have provenance information around your transitive dependencies and all those things. One of the other things about Salsa level four is that it, it includes code reviews. So this one was one that I made up. 
this was a there isn't a um, a standard to do code reviews. It's not uh, approved yet, but this has been submitted um, by someone at ChainGuard to upstream to, as a standardized way to create code reviews. And it just looks like this. So again, it's just a, a JSON or YAML document. That's all it is. And you can sign things. So you did a code review. You want a two peer review. That's part of Celsius level four. So in this case, Dan signs and Kim signs, and then they both sign that attestation. And because you can sign things multiple times, of course. So then you can go later, go back to verify that it was signed multiple times. Now that's specific to Salsa. Uh, again, though, it, it's uh, no matter which framework you're adopting, it is very similar. So I just highlighted some things from the software supply chain uh, security guide from the CIS benchmarks. Uh, you're signing and verifying commits, you're signing and verifying releases, the SBOM, uh, the build pipeline, the versioning, it's all signatures, validation, signatures, verify, signatures, verify, signatures, verify. So you can see the pattern. Uh, it's not going to be any different if you adopt a, a separate framework. It's going to be kind of a very similar story. Again, secure software development framework from NIST, very similar, uh, constantly signing things. You want uh, to be able to create an immutable log about what you signed, you know, that's ReCore, it's the immutable log. For audibility reasons, you wanna be doing signing commits. You want cryptographic evidence and hashes. You wanna be able to verify how things were built. Again, sign, verify, sign, verify, sign, verify, sign, verify, and all that needs to be automated. And that's really where Six Store comes in. Got two slides left, I think. Um, Git sign is something else we've been working on. And this is really what the GitHub uh, big announcement was about with NPM. The reason why Git sign is so important is because it's really uh, just so easy to use. And I'll, I'll show you a demo here where I'll actually uh, stand everything up from scratch in a repo that uh, hasn't been touched yet. Um, but you can do keyless signing. So you can do Git commits with signing six store. Um, either in a couple ways. You can set it up where every time you do a git commit, all you have to do is just add um, a flag to do the signing, um, or you can actually set up so you're just doing signing by default uh, every time. Um, and this is important for a lot of reasons. So if you saw the frameworks, you said it, there was a lot of information about you actually had to do sign com git commits. This is a great way to do it. Um, but it also can be critical to doing things like two peer reviews. So if you use GitLab or GitHub, um, there's ways if you have the enterprise version where you can do those things and then you can easily in integrate it into that. And one of the key things from GitHub, if you read their blogs around the announcement that they thought was that I thought was really interesting was, you know, they were very committed to having um, they're very they're very committed to increasing software supply chain security, but they were also very committed to having uh, the developers not um, for it to be very easy to use for developers. Right. And that's really where um, why Six Store was was so important in, in what they chose to help do that. Um, so when you do sign something, you'll see this little certificate that'll say it was created with SixStore.dev. Um, and this was a tweet I saw this week from Derek Shepard where he, um, you know, someone had actually tweeted at him that somebody had faked his email, which is something you can do with GitHub. I can go in and I can change my Git configs to any email and it'll show up that way in the log. Um, so he's saying, oh, I better sign this now. So actually there's cryptographic evidence that it was me that signed it. Um, and really six store is becoming uh, very important behind the Git sign project there. So I'll do a quick demo for you with Git sign. And there. And this is a new uh, repository and I've actually put my demo scripts in there also. So if you wanna see what those look like, you're welcome to go do that. Nothing really in here yet. Uh, there's no even Git file. Oh, no, because there should be just the basic Git files in here. So uh, there's just the Git folder in there. Um, and this is, I'm going to run a couple commands. This is all I have to do just one time, just the first time I set up the project. Uh, git config, I'm going to set the GPG sign equal to true. The GPG piece is more of a legacy piece, but this will tell me to sign all commits. So I can do that. And again, I only have to do this one time when I set up the repo. Uh, the next piece I'll do is I'll actually tell it to use git sign to sign those commits. So there we go. Use git sign. And then I can just uh, run this last one and I'll say that git sign expects uh, X509 certificate. Go. Oh. Okay. So now I can just uh, sign anything I want. Let's see. CF. Text. And can add that. And now, if I go to git commit,
There we go. And it's going to ask me to log in just as it did before. And there it goes. There, there it goes. There it went. And if I can look at the Git log and I can take a look at that. Done. And yes, there's my commit message. It says it used git sign. You can see the six store pieces here. And that'll be in the recore log also, if we want to go look at that. And I can also use six store to verify this. So I'm just going to run a couple of commands here so I can pull out some of the information out of, out of recore. Just to make it easier. And if I wanted to verify it, I can just use cosine verify. Now that I got the signature pieces out. And it'll tell me the record log entry. So if I actually go back to the website here, I can actually check that out. And this is what we just signed. Again, it came from me, Jay Osborne at Chingard. Actually, zoom in here. I realized I forgot to zoom in the last time I was here. Another key thing here is the key usage. So this can only be used for artifacts. These aren't signatures you can use for a, a website or anything like that. The usage is just code signing. And there shouldn't be too much else out here um, other than the verification. Again, that's the inclusion proof. If you wanted to verify that came from me, uh, you could go do that. And um, that it's in the record log. And again, it came from Six Store. Uh, it was only used for code signing. And it came from me. And that was the uh, piece there. Now I go to push it, and you can you should be able to see it in the repo. And if I go to J Osborne Six Store repos, let's see here. There we go, and there we go. Sign it. You can see the commit. If I come back here. Uh, it'll be, now it says um, unverified because GitHub hasn't added uh, the six store uh, public uh, the six store uh, certificate into its into its trust store. Uh, I think that is something that's going to happen, especially now with the announcements. So at some point that'll say verified, um, but you can see that it was signed and that it was uh, signed by six store. And getting to the end, a couple other key things. Um, why do we do all this? Eventually, if we want to make risk management based decisions, uh, this is an upstream uh, project I'm talking about with Six Store, but this is a chain guard. And we work kind of half and half, so we work upstream a lot with a lot of different projects, uh, quite a number of them actually in standards also. But on the product side, this is the other half of it. So we're basically uh, building products that are going to take all those artifacts and allow you to uh, do risk management based around software supply chain. So policies, continuous verification. Uh, eventing, alerts, uh, those types of things. Uh, last thing I'll mention, last slide, uh, this is very important. We did uh, work with the Linux Foundation and the, the OpenSSF around, um, around a free six-store training course. So that's been launched and you can uh, check out our blog. It's on EDX, uh, you can Google it also. Uh, there's a number of ways to get there, um, but uh, our team, uh, got a couple people, John and Lisa on our team, they did an amazing job on it. Uh, I've taken it and I think it's really great. And if you get a chance, go do it. It's free, it's not too long um, and it's great. Uh, appreciate you sticking with me on this. Uh, whenever, when, I'm recording it at night, but whenever you're, whenever you're uh, watching it, I uh, hope you enjoy it. And uh, again, uh, my name is John Osborne. You can reach out to me on Twitter uh, or email me jayosborne at chaingard.dev and happy to talk if you have any questions. Thank you, bye everyone.